Thank you. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the family is here tonight. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's very hard to believe that, that Triangle is 25 years old. Um, some of us think we must have still been in elementary school when it started, in spite of the fact that we know better. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, the way this is going to work, um, there's nothing more dismal than panels in which each person holds forth at some length, um, totally ignoring everybody else. And the other speakers don't listen because they're worried about what they're going to say. Uh, and then you have these unrelated statements and, and blank looks when they're finished. I'd like this to be a real conversation. I know everyone here has a lot of interesting things to say and uh, there are all kinds of cross connections. Uh, I am, as I've said many times, usually an immoderate moderator. It's too boring just sitting here, so I'm going to jump in with some authority, having, being, having been around Triangle since its beginning. What is Triangle? Well, most of you know. Uh, Triangle Artist Workshop was started in uh, 1982 by the sculptor Anthony Caro and an English collector, businessman, entrepreneur called uh, Robert Loder. Uh, Caro was looking for a place to store sculpture in, outside of New York City. And he was shown through Robert Loder a uh, abandoned uh, dairy farm in Dutchess County in upstate New York. Well, it was totally unsuitable for what he wanted, but he thought this would be a great place to have a two-week summer workshop. That was August 1982. Uh, the event was held in August 1982. It was organized very quickly. Um, a group of artists from the US, Canada, and Great Britain, those were the three points of the triangle, uh, they either all knew each other or knew of each other or knew each other's work. They all shared an aesthetic. It was very intense. It was very exciting. And everybody said, this is great. Let's do it again. Well, at that point, a rule had to be made. Nobody could come two years running. Or I think we'd still have the same 30 people who were there the first year. Because the formula is very simple. You bring together a group of artists from literally everywhere. Our triangle is now some unnameable figure with something like 43 points, artists from six continents. You bring them together. You choose the best ones who present themselves. A peer jury selects every year. You feed them. You house them. You give them studio space. You make them pay their own bar bills. We're not stupid. <laughs> and you see what happens. Most artists' residencies, artist colonies, hide people away. People work in, in privacy. The Triangle, everyone has place to plan ample studio space, but it's open. So everyone sees what everyone else is doing. There's enormous interchange and exchange. That's what it's about. We bring in visiting artists, we bring in visiting critics, some curators to rev up the discussion. It's a sheltered environment where people can take risks because everyone's in it together. This was Caro's intention, to combat the loneliness of the studio and to create a kind of healthy rivalry and support. It works. That's why we were around for 25 years. We've been peripatetic. We were in upstate New York. We've been in Barcelona. We've been in Marseille. We've been in another location on the other side of the Hudson. And we've been in the World Trade Center. We had hoped that we were in a permanent situation in the World Trade Center. We traded the isolation of the countryside for vertical isolation. And it was pretty extraordinary up there. Well, we were rendered homeless by September 11, and we had no idea what we were going to do. We've been described as the only Bedouin arts organization known. We're very flexible. We always say, well, if this doesn't work out, we'll load up the camels and go somewhere else. But loading up the camels was getting more and more difficult. 
luckily, um, our, we, a benefactor, uh, David Walentis, came to our rescue and we've had a permanent home in Dumbo, in Brooklyn, since 2002. We hope to stay there. Thanks also to Mr. Willentis, we now have, in addition to the two-week workshop, we have an ongoing residency program. The alumni of Triangle here, who I'm about to introduce, represent the whole span of Triangle's 25 years and its residency program. So to begin with Jill Nathanson on my left, your right, um, Jill was in the very first workshop in 1982 as a small child <laughs> and she was also at the 10th workshop and she is a valued board member of Triangle which is run by a large group of impecunious artists, curators, arts professionals. We, are, we do not have a money board but we have fantastic smarts. Uh, Jill has exhibited in New York since 1981, even before she was at Triangle. Uh, she currently shows with the Laurie Bookstein Gallery, where you can see her work until this weekend. Is the show? Saturday, yeah. yeah, this Saturday, in the exhibition "Color as Structure, Structure as Color," which, just to keep it all in the family, I put together. We, you know, we like to we like to keep everyone with us. <laughs> Um, Jill was work was seen last year at the Painting Center in Hans Hoffmann, The Legacy, and uh, she has done collaborative work with uh, the Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary, Arnold Eisen, and is currently the recipient of a grant from the Memorial Foundation for Jewish Culture to continue that project. Uh, Patrick Martinez. Um, was in the very first year of Triangle's new residency program at the time, uh, from March through June of 2003. Uh, Patrick is a French visual artist living in New York uh, since 2001 and is represented by the Brooklyn Gallery Parker's Box, which many of you may know. Uh, he refers us to his website, www.patrickmartinez.net. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen his exhibitions at Parker's Box, and I guess in the interest of full disclosure, I should say that Parker's Box is run by Alan Williams, who is a Triangle alumnus and <laughs> on the board as well. When I say we like to keep everybody part of the family close together, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Um, and on my right, um, Andrew Dunnell, who is a sculptor and associate professor of fine art at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro, uh, was a participant at Triangle uh, at the World Trade Center in 2000. And uh, we have um, Andy representing not only sculpture, which has always been a major part of Triangle, uh, although it's gotten more polymorphous in terms of the work that's made there. Um, but he is also, uh, uh, was part of that crucial move from the country to New York, and I hope we'll talk about that experience. And our newest recruit um, is uh, Hee Jung Cho, who is an installation artist who was born in Korea, but uh, lives in New York. Uh, works in New York. She's now in the PS122 program for 2008, uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2008. and uh, you recently came back from a Chinese residency program. Uh, interested in comparisons between that and Triangle. And Heejun was a participant in the most recent workshop, the 2006 workshop. So we have quite a broad span of media approaches and experiences. Uh, what we're going to do now is show you some images by each of the artists who will speak briefly about those images so you have a sense of what everybody does. And then um, we're going to have a conversation. Then we're going to open it up for questions and answers from you. So let me get out of the way here without you falling off the stage. Can just move through that one because it's a bad image. Go ahead and move through that one. Thanks. Okay. So this is a um, painting from uh, about eight years ago. I've always been involved with field painting and color in a field, but employing a lot of very strong differences, contrasts, pushes and pulls, um, incommensurate uh, forces, and um, 
that was kind of the work that led into what I'm doing now. So we could, we'll go, go through because we're not going to. This is a work on paper. This is in the show at Laurie Bookstein right now. Um, a lot of these works on paper, they're about this kind of movement across and this kind of setting up this kind of scales of weights and balances and they just started flowing off the picture and uh, it's been great fun working on them. This is about uh, 24 by 24 inches. Um, keep going, let's go. This is about uh, 55 by 55 and also the same, you know, kind of push and pull, setting up a field, negating it, um, setting up a whole lot of different kinds of color and surface and one more. And that's about 60 by 60. And that's also uptown now. That's it. Hi, this is the University of Maryland. All of these pieces are steel. And uh, I'm still coming to terms with this work. This is fairly new work for me. Uh, I'm in the process of a new body of work now. Um, and for a long time, I was making steel sculpture that really emphasized the weight and the mass and the density and, and the, the sort of steeliness of the material. And uh, through drawing predominantly, I've started to really try and play with it in a very different way now. Lift the mass and the weight of, up into the air, create a different kind of poetry with it, and uh, inject a bit of humor, and, and really try and you know, work the material in a way that I really don't expect to wouldn't have expected to work it. So there are a few of these shots of these pieces. These are all about, it's about seven feet tall. Almost like rubber. Okay. Now this, this piece is 2003 in Baltimore. And oftentimes I work large-scale sculptures with, I make them outdoors, um, simply because the scale reference is very different from working in the studio. So when you work outdoors, I think it's important to, to really pay attention to that. This piece was built for this site, um, and ultimately it was interesting to see it a year or two later in a gallery situation. Totally different object altogether in a gallery. And this piece I showed, this was 2001, I built this shortly after I did the Triangle workshop and I, I showed it because um, when I was at Triangle, I did a lot of drawing there too, and I had a realisation that I really, what if I built a drawing that you could walk through? Now it wasn't going to be feasible for me to do it there, but there, some things happened in the, in the intense two weeks that I was working at the World Trade Centre. Um, that led to this, this body of work. Uh, and this was the first piece that I built over six months. I then went to India. It was a piece in, in anticipation of working in a Lang in India. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, as a brief introduction, I could say that um, uh, what characterizes most my, uh, my work maybe would be the, the diversity of approaches, uh, which actually makes difficult to identify uh, a particular style. Uh, I do uh, mostly in installation, I do sculpture, I do, do drawings, uh, video, uh, as well as um, sound experiments. And uh, recently I also started an industrial design company, uh, which I, I see as a natural extension of my artistic uh, practice. And, uh, um, what you see here is an installation that I made at, at Parker's Box, uh, which I wanted uh, uh, very present, although there is almost nothing in it. Uh, it's basically uh, garbage bags that looks like they are full, and they are full of, uh, of uh, smoke that is lying very uh, low. Uh, this is a fog that uh, once the garbage bag is full, it's starts cascading down uh, onto the, the floor. Uh, so there's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's very full. At the same time, uh, it's almost, it's uh, nothing. You blow on it and it's gone. Yeah, that's the effect uh, it does. Okay. 
it's another installation that uh, I made at also at Parker's Box. That was for my first solo show there. And I was right after the residency I had at Triangle. And uh, I guess somehow it influenced uh, my, my work back then. And for my first solo show, I decided to destroy the floor of the gallery, which, uh, and Alan Williams, the, the, the director of the gallery, uh, uh, actually allowed me to do that, which is, uh, which is great. I'm always thankful for that. And uh, the idea was to uh, fill up um, holes that made in the floor of the gallery uh, with, the, with the fluorescent paint in its liquid form. So it's about painting somehow, but uh, uh, it doesn't have any shape in particular. It just fills up holes. Um, you can show the next picture. Yeah, at dif dif uh, different points of the gallery. So it looks like the, 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 the whole basement could have been flooded with a toxic material or something like that. And also there was a, a, a system of a, a compressor hidden in the basement and that was blowing air into the, the, the holes. Uh, so the, the, how do you say, holes? The puddles were uh, bubbling, and uh, when I when I worked on this piece, I actually collaborated with a, a company uh, called Golden Golden Paint, and uh, in order to make a, a paint with a certain viscosity, uh, in order to retain the uh, and trap the air at the bottom of the of the of the holes, so that it could explode with a certain uh, it was a certain noise. It was uh, very frightening. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> so, but in a, in a, in general, I uh, I investigate the uh, relationship uh, between an object and its, its context of uh, production and also in presentation uh, in order to to challenge conventional perception. That what could characterize pretty much my work in general. Uh, this is um, the 2007 in Korea. I recently have a, had a, a solo show in Brain Factory, Seoul, Korea. And this is t uh, called The Language of Light. And it's a wall paint. Um, I'm, uh, recently I'm working on a language, a text, text of a uh, text written in a visual language uh, which I made. So actually, each shape of a character is a, uh, the shape of a light. So the first of all, uh, the light is shown on the wall you know, through the window in inner space. And I just uh, trace all the shape of a light and then uh, the play with them as a text. So, and this is also called the language of light in 2005 in New Jersey. And it's about uh, 13 by like uh, 13 by uh, five feet like high, uh, five five by 13 by feet, and uh, it's also a uh, same idea. Um, uh, the light actually um, the the other the installation was uh, the light actually uh, the. I got in a studio, but this light actually got in a, my home. So it's a different uh, style of a language, uh, the text. And I made a, <coughs> made a different um, the sheet of a text and represent a different time and place. Um, uh, it's a call uh, American Dream of a 170 square feet room. Uh, in Korea, um, the floor floor piece actually uh, made of a uh, the all reject letter from uh, reject re uh, reject letter I applied for, and I covered uh, I covered it uh, covered them all over, over the, my room and also the draw uh, all furniture on the wall with uh, my hair and the hollow the chair leg. Um, 
uh, 2004 um, New Jersey and called Studio. And, <coughs> and I cover the photo images uh, of uh, my the, the uh, studio in Korea and bring over to the uh, the studio in New Jersey and covered all the studio and um, uh, and then I collaged a, a photo image on the floor and then taped over and over and I can see what it is and the chair is also hollow tape and yeah that's it Can you get the lights back on Thanks, Katie. Yes. For now. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I'll, I was going to start out and disagree with Karen. Um, it, it doesn't feel like just yesterday to me. <laughs> no, it doesn't. 1982 feels like a very long time ago. It was a very different art world um, and very different triangle. Uh, when I was, I was invited to Triangle by Tony Caro in spring of 82, and I didn't know anybody when I arrived. I didn't know a soul. I just came in this enormous barns and... I had no work with me and you didn't know anybody and it was just this sort of bizarre, scary experience. But we were all kind of involved with the same thing. We were all kind of involved with how do you already abstract painting and color-based painting were not what was happening. It was already um, you know, not fashionable. There was not that much interest. And we were all kind of from our different places concerned with how do you make this contemporary, how do you bring this into a new generation, but we were all so much speaking the same language, so I'm wondering how it is, you know, for those of you who were there so much later, I was also there in 91 and already it was not the same language, but it was, it seems now Triangle is so diverse, I just don't even know how people talk about each other's work. When, when you were there, that in 2006, um, Lee Jung, that was the most diverse workshop we've ever had. Mm -hmm. And I frankly was a little apprehensive because there were a lot of people who were focused on uh, computers, like Jason Lewin and mm -hmm. um, uh, various other people. And I thought, how are they going to have this experience that we all think is so crucial to triangle this exchange? And they all said, oh, it's wonderful. We're having such a good time talking to people. Um, how did you find it? Um, the first of all, um, the triangle uh, space was very open. So uh, I, um, I can see many other, you know, the triangle people are just still working on. Just some other people are just working on the video and the painting, abstract painting or installation. And, uh, so many different things. I so really, um, I was very um, encouraged to uh, do very experimental things because uh, um, otherwise, I just uh, maybe it's isolated at uh, my studio and just working on, you know, just uh, looking at my piece all the time. So I guess uh, um, the really good thing in Triangle uh, workshop program was uh, just. Uh, interacting, you know, other the, the artists a lot. And I didn't actually know the trying uh, the this you know this time the two thousand six was the mm -hmm. most diverse um, the media because because uh, uh, since I know the triangle I saw many you know the the works from the website I saw many different kind of things. So mm -hmm. and yeah. Every every year it gets a little more so, which is obviously a reflection of what's what's going on in the art world, where you know, everyone was a painter or a sculptor in 1982. Uh, by the time you were in the World Trade Center, that was already changing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there was a lot of diversity 
And I thought that was, that was interesting. It was the interesting part of that experience. The great thing about that experience, the World Trade Center, I thought, I mean, what am I going to do in there? This is not a steel shop. This is not the sort of industrial space that I'm used to working in. It was unfamiliar. But what could I do in there? Now, obviously, drawing is something you can take anywhere. You just take paper and take pens, you can, and you can draw. But, um, and, and really, all of the organizers at, at Triangle made it very, you know, were very good at helping us get materials, but it was quite difficult getting those materials upstairs if you wanted to make objects. Because the security, ironically enough, I mean, the, the, the security checks were, were crazy. I mean, checkpoints all over the place that moved. So if you wanted to move half a ton of cement to the, to the 91st floor, or a few boards, or some found objects and work with it, it was quite, you know, you had to jump through hoops. Once in that space, um, you know, people were being very inventive. We, and that was the great thing about it. You know, you, you, had, you, you saw, we went around the stairwells at night, the back stairwells, found materials and used that. And when you're in there, you just got to really work with what you've got and and uh, and, and force yourself to rethink uh, preconceptions or things that you, you know, break habits. Um, and I could see this across the board. A few people, I think, mm -hmm. came in and did what they do. But the people that really got a lot out of that uh, workshop came in and did something radically different and took a chance and, and stuck their necks out. And I think that's really what it's about. And, and there's a lot of energy and intensity and a lot of dialogue amongst the critics that were there, the other artists, the organizers. I thought it was an electrifying time. Very nerve-wracking. I was very nervous up there. The building was swaying. You couldn't. You couldn't open the windows. I kept peering at. I mean, all of this in retrospect. You, you didn't want to open those windows. We were on the 91st <laughs> floor. Uh, we had a quarter of a floor of raw space. Uh, we could see 50 miles north, mm -hmm. and we could see 50 miles east, and it was pretty thrilling. Absolutely. And you certainly rose to the challenge. Well, I, uh, I wrestled. I, I remember one night w working all night because we, we had access all night. Um, and I was stuffing all kinds of stuff into the rafters, I recall. And I was trying to think about what I'd done. It's been seven years. And, and at the end of it, I ripped it all apart and fell asleep on the floor amongst the debris. Uh, and, uh, and again, another, another revelation happened there. I, I figured out somehow how to make line maintain mass in a sculpture, which I've never done before. And it led me to rethink what I was doing with mass in sculpture, and I'm still investigating how I can use that language in the work now. So all sorts of pretty interesting things came out of that experience, unexpectedly, for me. There was this also this, you know, you mentioned how, you know, working all night, I, I think most people, I, mean, I see a lot of people here have been to Triangle, but I think most people work harder than they've ever worked, partly out of competition, yeah. and partly because you just feel so seen, you know, you just feel so um, revealed, and to be standing there doing nothing, you know, <laughs> when you could be getting better or doing more, it's just, you just can't bear to do nothing. So uh, people just make enormous strides and just do things, you just do things you didn't think you would do. I don't know, did you have that experience of working especially hard, or...? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. For doing my own things? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, because I'm living in New York, I you know, easily to find uh, our supplies and all the things. I, yeah, I didn't have any hard thing, but the trying, uh, when I was there, is really international, and a lot of different um, artists from the other countries. And I guess uh, uh, really uh, the location of a triangle is really good. And people can easily you know, get to you know, place, you know, New York City, and, which is really big you know, art market. So people can just uh, go in and out freely and find out their material, I guess. I don't know. We're sort of hoping you don't go in and out. We're hoping you stay there and do what Jill, what Jill is right. <laughs> Patrick, you were there in a different circumstance. You, you weren't in this compressed uh, pressure cooker atmosphere. You were there for leisurely three months of, yeah. of residency. But I seem to remember you, every time I went to the studios, you were there working just as hard. 
Yes, but there was no, I remember there was absolutely no competition because there was a very different situation uh, when I got there. Um, and that's what strikes me about the triangle. It seems that it's a kind of old structure now, mm -hmm. but it's always new. The, the situation is always different mm -hmm. and each of, of us have a different experience of, of, of what tri triangle is. So there's no clear definition of what it is for me. Uh, I was invited to participate in that in that residency program, and we were only uh, three artists, and we were given a huge uh, warehouse, what do you call it? warehouse in Dumbo, and at that time there was a very uh, specific period where uh, real estate was taking over the whole neighborhood to transform it into uh, luxury condominiums, and uh, so. All the artists that were in the building at that time were about to be uh, uh, relocated, to put it nicely, <laughs> uh, thrown out. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were given that space, that huge space, three, three of us. And, uh, and what I liked the most about this space is that it was, it was completely messy. And, uh, but in a good sense, because uh, uh, we had to, there was absolutely no rules and we, we had to invent them. Uh, and even the people who were leading the program at that time, they didn't have a, even a chair to sit down on it. So, so we had to find furniture to first build the office for the people leading the program. And then for us... I should uh, say, we lost every, all our furniture in... September, on September 11th. It wasn't that they were, we were that ill-prepared. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it was a very unique uh, situation. <laughs> and we didn't know really what to do with uh, all that uh, space because of course there was no resources or nothing. So we would start uh, finding things uh, maybe in the garbage or visiting the, the rest of the building to find things that we could work with. And, uh, and, uh, and pretty soon, uh, actually, uh, one of the artists, Akane, Japanese artist, uh, started to, to live in the, in, in the building and uh, start, started cooking very often, uh, organize, uh, organize um, video programs. There was every, every week a, video, a different video program with a lot of people visiting. Uh, another artist, Eve, who's here in the audience, actually started to move in with the uh, with the heavy machinery and uh, set up a uh, whole ebenistry. How do you say ebenist? Ebenist uh, 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 woodworking woodworking studio with uh, heavy saws and uh, things like that. And on my part, I started to to uh, I had a, a, a band at that time. I started making uh, very noisy music. Uh, all day and build a studio uh, with uh, with cardboard. So that's how we started. But uh, what was great is that we were there every day, pretty much, and uh, visiting each other. And uh, and yeah, that was a quite unique uh, situation. Very energizing, and uh, that's what we needed, I think, at the time. Yeah. It, as you say, uh, you, you've hit on something very important. I mean, it, it, every year is different, and every residency is different. Uh, the residency program is much younger, but already we have enormous variety and a combination of people's practice, people's personalities, uh, the weather. I mean, it's, it's uh, totally unpredictable. The only thing that, that doesn't change is the basic formula. And the, the outreach is uh, one of the things that I think we all valued most. I mean, even here, but not even, particularly here, I mean, there's a long history of relationship between the studio school and Triangle. The Graham Nixon, the director of the school, has been a visitor to the studios many times. Uh, we have uh, alumni um, who teach at the studio school. Uh, Lee Tribe, uh, the sculptor, has been, is an alumnus. Jelaine Jones, uh, who teaches in the sculpture department, is an alumna. Uh, I see here uh, one of our recent uh, alumni, Alana Baldwin, who was in the workshop with you. 
Uh, it's, and I know I'm leaving people out. Uh, Christina Key, who introduced us, helped run the 2006 workshop. So we have, uh, a, right here, uh, our tentacles are out. And this goes all over the world. And the, the exchanges and the connections are, are part of what keeps it vital. Um, just, you know, it, from the sort of make up of this panel, it certainly seems like we're going sort of from painting and sculpture to, you know, more alternative mm -hmm. media. But, uh, you know, as, a, as an old, sort of old fogey triangle person, I've never quite understood exactly what holds the contemporary triangle together. But I'm told that it's just a matter of who applies that year. So, Karen, if there were, let's say, 200 portrait artists who applied to triangle, and a lot of them were very good. Would you pick 30 portrait artists? Could that happen, or is it? Or do you try to make it diverse? <laughs> well, the, the way the jury works, and um, the juries are a totally different composition every year. Uh, there's always somebody from the triangle board, but not the same somebody, um, unless we can't Shanghai any of the others to be in it. We bring in outsiders. Uh, in my experience, the way the board works is the juring is done blind. You start looking at what's presented, slides, videos, CDs, whatever comes in. And nobody really knows who anybody is. Each person sends six images. And you go through, and if one person of the jury says, I want to see that again, it stays in. If nobody's interested, it goes out. Uh, only after you have got it down to a manageable number. Then you start saying, well look, we have eight male painters from the New York area out of the 60 people that we've chosen. And we only have room for 25 people. So if we're going to eliminate, we're going to eliminate from the eight male painters from the New York area. Um, if it was out of the 60 people, we had 30 good portrait painters. Um, they'd stay in if, if there was you know, nothing counter, counterbalancing. But the, but the initial selection is done just on merit without thinking about what the medium is, where it comes from, who is it. There's a little you know, balancing out at the end. You know, We've got 19 women and only three men. Do you think we ought to look at you know? Um, so you, you do try to get the most diverse and balanced group possible. But the first thing is always excellence, no matter what the approach. And it gets harder. You know, when someone, someone presents work from Sri Lanka, and you have absolutely no context for it, but you're excited about the work. Um, you, we, we had an artist from Sri Lanka in 2004, and we knew nothing about it. Um, I, I, I wasn't on that jury, but I, I saw the work, and everyone was very, very excited about the work, and the decision was, we have no idea if he's representative of what's going on, we have no idea of what else is happening, but this is exciting work, he should come. And he did. Um, so it's, it, a lot of it's blind faith. But, um, some, someone once said, you just take the best work that, <coughs> turn, that presents itself and you hope for the best. I would say, though, that and if any of you are fortunate enough to get into this um, residency, either the, the longer one or the, mm -hmm. the two-week residency, I would. I decided that what I'd do was go in with really no expectation. And uh, I'd lived in New York before. I could quite easily have come here, stayed with friends, gone to, mm -hmm. gone to the World Trade Center, and gone away again at the end of the day and done familiar things again. I didn't. I stayed in a bed and breakfast in Brooklyn, which was very weird. Um, pleasant. Weird, weird is part of it. Pleasant, pleasant, but unusual. It was all part of the whole thing. So, you know, keep having breakfast with the artists in the morning in this B and B, and then making your way through Brooklyn, um, you know, gathering things on the way so that you've got something to make art with, um, was all part of the experience. And had I not done that, it, it was very rich. It was all part of um, really what informed the work and what the work that I made there was about, um, as much as you know, 
being amongst a group of artists, responding to their work, responding to the discussion that we have. Um, so that's what was fruitful. It was two weeks of a very unusual, very memorable, and, and having had time to think back on it, um, a very important couple of weeks, really. I mean, it really was. It, it, it sort of stuck a wrench in the works, and that's really important, because you get in your studio, and you, everybody has habits, you, you have a way of working, and to take yourself and put yourself in a situation where you don't have the comfort of that familiarity, um, and, you know, as I said earlier, to, to force yourself to be inventive and rethink, and really think on your feet, um, I think is, is invaluable. It was a great thing to do. What was the worst thing that happened? <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, someone else answered. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think the worst, the worst thing is, 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 you know, somebody said when, you know, when I, I, nothing terrible really happened, but it, it's, it's not good when people are just there doing what they are used to doing. Right. You know, and then it's, you're sort of like, well, what am I here for? It's a, it's a big sacrifice to kind of uproot yourself and reveal yourself and it, there's this enormous, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's like a therapy session, but it, it's not at all, but it, it is this, this you know, enormously revealed kind of situation and then when other people are there and they're just kind of, you know, showing off or, you know, they're not really jumping in with both feet, that's the drag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are people like that who are just there to promote themselves or to meet people or whatever. And that's really not the spirit of it. It's really a place for people who are not going to do that, you know, who are just going to accept that who you are is just who you are in that week and what you make. And that's all people care about. And so that's, that's sort of the drag when people come and they're, they're facile about it. Or they're trying to, you know, promote their careers. At the end, there's a, a sort of a closing or a, a, an opportunity for people to come and see what everybody did, and uh, which is great. But you know, it isn't a store. You don't set up and sort of right. present here. You're looking for a gallery or something. It's not about that. I mean, it's about making art, and it's about, you know, it's it's, it's kind of difficult because oftentimes when you make a piece of artwork. It's, when it's in a gallery or it's out in the world, nobody gets to see the process, oftentimes, unless you're the sort of artist that involves that in the work, which is very brave. Um, so you see a piece of sculpture or painting or whatever it is, uh, you see the finished product. You don't know what goes into that necessarily, and all the times you've ripped it to pieces and it's nearly failed, and, and, uh, and that's what art's about, as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, so it's difficult, it's a little bit stressful in a way because you've got a lot of other artists around you and you're all there sort of revealing your process. But it's interesting to see how other people, if they let themselves do that and be revealed, work too. And then at the end, when people come and see this work, you know, um, in it, hopefully, honestly, um, for all of its successes and failures, um, you know, it's just the residue of a process of making, which is what art's all about for me. So there it is, and, and there's, there's, you know, there's an integrity about that which I, which I really thought was, went down well. Ian, you said you were, um, you enjoyed the, the variety of people there. Mm -hmm. um, was there anyone who, with whom you had particularly good exchange? Uh, um, uh, actually, the two weeks is a really short time for me. And I'm kind of a shy person, so it's really take a long time to get to know each other. So, but I had a really uh, good critique from um, my uh, next to me, uh, Jim, and also uh, the Malado in audience, and mm -hmm. so Nora, you know, Abani, and uh, but I don't. Um, it was not actually enough, uh, enough, uh, you know, time for me, you know. I have to get you back for a residency. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mostly. What about you, Patrick? Were, were people coming? Uh, were there people visiting the studio who were um, important? Yeah. Or? Well, that may be the worst thing of, of the program. Uh, Is it was a great, uh, great time for for working. Uh, as long as we were working, that was uh, that was great. But then when we were expecting visitors. 
uh, nobody came, you know, <laughs> especially at the end. But that's mm -hmm. a problem when you work in such a raw space mm -hmm. like this, especially because it's in Dumbo. Uh, it's on the on the weekend. It happened that it was raining a lot when we when we were showing what we had done. So not a, a lot of people came. So we were just a little disappointed about mm -hmm. about that. But I guess that's. I guess that's what happens anyway uh, for every show, every show you you make because it's such uh, a big energy you put into the into the work, and uh, when everything stops, it's like nothing is left. It's like you're left by yourself all alone, and then it's all, always a little frustrating, you know. But that applies to every show, uh, I think. But uh, no, I, I don't think it's anything. Bad in because I think I didn't have any expectation, so everything was a was a surprise, and uh, I, I tried to make the the best of the, of the time I had there. Um, yeah, there was just maybe a little short. Even the the question of the of the duration is is always a problem because you, mm -hmm. you maybe you stayed 15 days and you find it too short. I stayed three months, almost four, and it was too short. Even if you stay a year, you would think, oh, right. let's see the, the end. So, but the yeah. residencies are now six months. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's so we're, much better. We're responding you to that. And, and we, also do, we also do a little better with getting people out. That's yeah. partly because Dumbo has become more gentrified and there are more restaurants and more shops and more people. And mm -hmm. so. I'm going to ask a question in my role as as, as old fuddy-duddy. Um, do you think that um, if Tony Caro saw the last residency, that he would be as excited about it as he was about the first residency? Do you think that um, that everybody sort of feels equally um, happy with all the changes? Um, well, I think um, the answer to that question is yes and no. Um, as those of you who know Tony, and there are many of you in the audience who do, know that he has never settled for what he knows he can do. And starting October 18th, you'll be able to see what he's been doing recently. His exhibition is opening uh, at Mitchell Innes and Nash on 26th Street. But uh, whether he will find, would have found work that would uh, he, that would feed his own practice uh, in the way that he did with the first years of Triangle, um, I don't know. But he, is, he has always remained uh, interested and open and curious about what's going on. After all, this is a man who, when he was teaching at St. Martin's, could count among his students not only people like uh, Tim Scott and David Annesley and Philip King and Isaac Witkin and Michael Bolas, but also Gilbert and George. Yeah. So uh, he's he's curious. He never says no. I, you know, only I know what's good, and nothing else is of interest. And he he will uh, he'll also always remain open and curious. Yeah. And my sense was that when he's one of the reasons he started it was that he his own career had been nurtured by uh, close studio contacts and a lot of studio visits with mm -hmm. people with whom he felt a lot of aesthetic kinship. And so he, I think, wanted to kind of create that same fertile atmosphere for those of us who were working abstractly and maybe were more isolated. And it's certainly different now. It's certainly not that same, you know, kind of, uh, you know, somewhat cohesive aesthetic. It's, so a it's, totally, it's quite different. It's a totally incoherent aesthetic. And um, I think for some, for some participants, it can be a little lonely. Uh, you know, the, the painters are, are kind of all off on one side, or, you know, all six of them. And uh, they're very, very different, very different kinds of painters. Um, but somebody uh, in one of the, the transitional workshops, when it was starting to open up, because Obviously, as we all know, the art world has expanded enormously in terms of materials, approaches, beliefs of what art can be. Um, and a, a number of us felt very, 
haunted very, very strongly that it, the triangle had to respond to that uh, because otherwise it risked becoming an academy and that was the last thing in the world we yeah. wanted it to be. One of the artists in, in the, must have been the early 90s, said to me that he was at first horrified by some of the work that he saw being made around him because it was so unlike anything that he aspired to in his own work. But he said he found it extremely helpful to have to confront it, even, even if it, he ended up saying, no, this is not for me. It clarified what he thought about his own work. Um, I don't know, every, you know, we, we make it up as we go along. And uh, happily there are people who, who share that spirit. You know, we need to get a list from everybody about what we can do to make it better. <laughs> I think it's probably a good time to open this up to questions. Uh, if anyone has any burning... Yes? Uh, you submit an application. There's a website which is www.triangleworkshop, all one word, dot org. And triangleworkshop.org. And uh, that gives you a lot of our history. And the, the workshop is every two years. The residency is, uh, there are two, cy two cycles of application. Yes, Willard, twice a year? No. We have three studios. One is uh, financed by the French government and is open only to French nationals or French residents. Um, one is financed by the Berlin Senate and has similar restrictions. And the third studio has, those are one year residencies. The third studio is our two six month residencies uh, which are uh, selected by Triangle. They, we offer studio space and uh, open studios and more people visiting than when, when Patrick was there. Uh, we do not offer uh, housing during the residency. That's only during the workshop. What am I leaving out, Willard? <laughs> yes? Uh, I'd like to hear some more specific responses maybe to, to uh, put from the, the more recent uh, participants about exactly what the, the benefits of sharing studio space with other artists were, or how, how much of a benefit there was from sharing studio space with other artists. Because it sounds from the descriptions as though uh, it may have been more, for example, with the, the loud music and, and the cooking and so on, it <laughs> more, more of a distraction from work that, that other people were doing. And I wonder how, how much you could actually learn from your fellow uh, participants or whether it was really learning against them or, or locking them out so that you could work. Well, actually, you may, if I may. You, I was going to say I you should saying, answer that. Yes, because I was a resident uh, with Patrick, who was in the lab of noise, and uh, the cooking lady. And I was the third girl in the tools. So um, the space was so large, so huge, and everything was so respectful to the, to the other that it would never interrupt anybody's work time process or anything like this. So we would actually participate in help each other. When it was uh, Wednesday night for uh, academic Japanese girl who would come and help, uh, when uh, Patrick would come up to the concert, well, we would stay and listen, and um, they were actually quite nice. I wouldn't put too much noise with the machine for academic. So I didn't, I didn't experience any um, uh, disrespect or anything like this, you know, but it was really amazing, like three such different worlds, like, so, so I mean, it's crazy, it's just like, I cannot imagine that you could, because if you choose some, somebody to share a studio with in New York, for example, and you pick up some Craigslist or something like this, you kind of go for somebody that you know, you can um, at the same kind of work or, you know, projects or whatever. That you end up like sharing uh, a space with some people that you have, you know, 
that that process is like it's foreign to you, you know. So it's really, really happy. It's great. Everyone had a great time. Yeah, if, if I may add something, actually, what we were doing was uh, on top of also of uh, our work as well. So actually, we were spending a lot of time there, doing a lot of work. So there was a, sp a specific moment, a time frame, uh, for uh, where we were very committed to to our work. And uh, for example, uh, Akane, the Japanese uh, artist were organizing all this, but at the same time, uh, in the, the main space of the, of the warehouse, uh, she, she built a very ambitious piece with an architect. Uh, she built a, a, a long tunnel that was taking the whole space for a very, very ambitious uh, installation work. So it was a, a part of the energy at, at, that, at that moment. But, uh, you know, sometimes the... the I mean, for, for me, working uh, in, uh, in a studio, wherever it is, because sometimes I have very small spaces, sometimes very big, sometimes no space at all, it's not so much a question of space. It's more a question of, uh, of uh, time. Uh, for me, work is, uh, is uh, putting yourself in a certain position, which is a, a um, state of, of mind somehow. It's you decide you're at work. No matter what, where where you are, actually, I, I can work sometimes in the subway. So it really doesn't matter. So it's more about deciding. Okay, that time frame, that's work, and uh, so you focus. You're very committed to, to to what you do, and I guess that's what what happened when we were all in that residency. There was a very we did, we knew we didn't have much time, but we tried to make the the best out of it. Malada, you were at the 2006 workshop. You're a painter. Yeah. Uh, can you speak about your experience of it? Um, I actually went a little 3D there. Um, <laughs> all the influence that I wrote around me and the materials and the access to the equipment, which was really amazing. Um, I think that was a very special moment for me. And then I went back to the studio Christina? Oh, 
Are you in? Are you still in touch with people from the workshops? Uh, a little bit, but I just wanted to say um, that I, I think, Christine, that I, I think that's really that's really true. That you see that, that you have a, maybe a commonality with the personality, but the work, but your work has nothing to do with them. And then you start to it starts to open up. And also, it's it's um, you're you're competing in a way, but in a way, another way, it's a very non-competitive atmosphere. So you can talk in a way that you wouldn't elsewhere. But I'm in touch with some people, yeah. I think that there was a time in my life when it sort of, there was maybe 10 years when I was really in touch with people. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, your lives change and your work changes again, so. What about you, Andy? Yeah, somewhat. I mean, mm -hmm. some people I knew before, who, mm -hmm. who'd been at Triangle before I, I, I participated. And when I went to India, I got a hold of Manu mm -hmm. and uh, looked him up. So, yeah. Um, it's interesting for me. It was a really, it was a moment in time mm -hmm. that was a, it was very clear, and uh, the thing that I found interesting uh, was that not only are you looking at your work through your own eyes <clears throat> when you're interacting with people. Um, I remember at one point I was trying to do something and somebody, somebody wheeled up a scaffolding on wheels and said, climb up on that, Andy. Because and, I'd just forgotten to look at it from a different point of view. So I climbed on this thing and he's wheeling me around the Lord Grey Centre floor on this thing so I could see you know, what I was doing from a different point of view. And I, you know, I'd forgotten to do it, which I often do in the studio. I'm always walking around, I'm always climbing on things and, and trying to figure out what, I'm, you know, what possibilities the, the sculptures have in space. Um, and for whatever reason, I forgot to do that, and th there was a block. Um, you know, Willard had come in, and he made some suggestions at one point um, that were, you know, that were encouraging to push it further, because I was sort of being tentative about it. And he's like, just do it, you know, make it, go for it. Uh, and you know, that's it. It was, you know, because you're in that environment, what the hell, I'll just do it. And, and, you know, you do that in your studio, but what you were saying earlier about the discipline, and timing yourself when you go back to the studio, that's interesting too because you know the pr your practice can change and you can discipline yourself to finish work. It's easy just to let it go a bit longer. Timing is completely essential making works of art, but you can sometimes through forcing the issue, not forcing the you know the end, the finish. Um, you sort of force through things that you didn't expect to come across, and that's what I'm always looking for. And uh, I'm trying to find something I don't know. Um, you know, if I see something I do know, I'm very suspicious, and I smash it pretty quickly until I don't know it anymore. And then hopefully I start to see it again in a different way, which I can. It doesn't always work. It didn't always work a triangle. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, the invention could be defined as a novel idea rendered as an object for technology, then couldn't you see your, yourself as inventing things, maybe very different things, but all of you are engaged in the creation of inventions, and therefore you're all doing essentially the same thing, but working in the same style. Maybe that might take a little time to figure out. No. Well, I mean, everybody is, is working in uh, these days because of the enormous diversity of, of people's practices and because uh, Triangle really has become global in the last f 10 years in the way everything has become global. Um, you, do, you do get many, many different approaches, but yes, the spirit remains the same, no matter what material you're working in and what you're making. I think this, the, the, uh, the discussion here, I think, has, has shown that there is, is common ground, um, even though it might be work that is of, in itself, not of particular interest uh, to another. Because painting, traditional painting, is just making a square object, you know, defined by your hand, rigidly of being a paint ordered in a certain way on a, on a flat surface. Um, and so it, it's, as an object, it's one painting is like another painting. Um, and so
So in order for it to become an invention, it has to take our module by following it. And that you see three-dimensional. I mean, there's all sorts of ways to make it that you can take by following it. On the other side, you have the, you know, the painting is dead sort of idea, which is a, another way of saying paintings are not uh, well, I, I guess I would. I, I don't think of a painting as an invention. I, I, and I guess I see that I'm working with a certain relationships, and I'm expanding what those relationships are. And I see that all the other artists are working with certain relationships, and they're working with relationships between these, the relationships on the piece and the person who's and the viewer. So we're, we're, I think you start to expand that way. I mean, what you're saying of trying to find a way to talk about it all together is, 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 is good, but I would see it more in terms of, of relationships. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think novel has anything to do with good art. And, and so they're all novels. No, novel suggests, novel suggests a quest for newness for the sake of newness. And my experience of 25 years of spending time in these studios with, with the triangle artists, as well as many other artists, I've yet to come across anybody serious who is trying to be new for the sake of being new. They try to be intense. They try to be specific. They try to be personal. They may end up doing something that's unprecedented, but they don't set out to be new for the sake of newness. That's novelty art, and novelty is usually made of plastic and sold on Canal Street. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you have a hand up? I did. I wanted to get back to something Jill's. Jill's poking at since you started this evening, which is the evolution of the triangle mm -hmm. phenomenon, the evolution of the whole project from a very coherent group of artists who share a lot of aesthetic ideas to what it is today. And I have two answers to that, two, two comments to make about that. First is what we've heard tonight about the evolution of Triangle New York, as is demonstrated by who sits at the table. Uh, and interestingly enough, the projects that have come out of Triangle from the very start, after in the mid-80s, artists from abroad took, this, took the Triangle idea back home and started workshops in their own bailiwicks. So as it stands now, there are approximately 35 workshops worldwide, China, India, Australia, uh, all over the world, up to Africa, there are about a dozen in Africa. And they all share the same model. They, they share the, the essential idea of putting 25 to 30 artists together for and in each of their cases, they began with a group of local artists, who, many of whom shared the aesthetic ground. And as their projects developed, became following the, the rule that we have few repeaters, uh, their projects evolved more diverse, more often more international, but certainly more diverse enterprises. And it just seems to be the nature of this beast that it's going to grow with the time and eventually come to reflect the time more than it might have at the outset. I think that's, I think the strength of it is that it's surviving, in fact thriving, all over the world in the same the same simple formula based on that the simple idea that artists learn from each other. And to get back to Jill's question with Tony Caro, what would he think of today's workshop? I think a way of answering that 
would be, uh, this is a, a guess on my part. I would guess that the more interesting way to answer it is would be to ask what kind of workshop would Carol put together today if we ask him to be the juror for, mm -hmm. for next year's trial. And I would bet you it would bear so little resemblance to 1982 that you would be shocked and amazed. I think that we as artists can learn a lot from colleagues who are within working in our way. We have a lot to learn from them. It affects our immediate and current practice. And we have a lot to learn by being challenged by lots of different practices. And Carol is one of his great strengths is he is an incredible magpie and takes and steals from the most diverse work methods you can think of. And I think given the world today, there's no doubt in my mind that, that a workshop he can put together would have a lot of the kind of richness and variety that we see in the workshop today. Maybe maybe we should try it. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd like to speak very briefly as a participant in Triangle, um, which I have been as both a resident and a visiting critic. And I can only say that I have learned so much from the challenge of being confronted by this whole range of work over the years, even when it was within a coherent aesthetic, coming in to look at work by an artist whom I have may, may have no connection with, uh, no idea about what they're doing, no familiarity with the context. Uh, that is very hard. It's eye testing. I have to respond. I can't just say, very nice, and go away. And the conversations that I've had with artists um, have enriched my experience enormously, um, widened my experience, and, and for that I'm very grateful. And I hope I'll get asked back. <laughs> well, I, I also think that, um, you know, I've, I've sort of imagined the triangle can really teach critics an awful lot, because critics don't get to see artists working too often, I mean, above and beyond you, mm -hmm. and, you know, as you're training younger critics. That's, we we that's keep really, inviting them. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Yeah. Well, as, as many of my students here have, have heard me say, I, I firmly believe the best criticism is informed by studio experience, and you can track that through the history of criticism. So part of our job is to expose people to that. And uh, we, we keep asking younger critics, and I think uh, we're seeing some results with a few of them. For those of you who are curious, you can see work by many Triangle alumni until October 20th. We're having a 20th anniversary exhibition and sale. We do have to try to keep our self, uh, selves above water. How we have managed to survive for 25 years with no endowment, uh, you know, like Blanche Dubois, we depend on the kindness of strangers. <laughs> And some strangers have been very kind indeed, and some strangers have become good friends. But we do have a wonderful exhibition of about 50 of our international alumni, uh, many small format works, and some larger installation pieces by New York area artists. Uh, that exhibition is in Dumbo. Um, in, the building is 70 Washington Street, but the space that we're in is the corner of uh, Washington and Front Street with the entrance on Front Street. Uh, that show will be up through October 20th, and for the hours that it's open, consult our website. Wednesday to Sunday? Wednesday to Sunday from 12, 12 to 8? 2 to 8. 2 to 8. 2 to 8. It's a very good show, and a huge diversity uh, of high quality work. Thank you. Thank you.